I'd like to ask everybody, if they would, to please get settled in for the morning session. Grab your, charge your coffee, grab something to eat, make yourself comfortable. We know our students and some others will be wandering in as the day goes along. So I'm Steve Slick. I'm the director of the university's Intelligence Studies Project. Um, on behalf of the university, the Intelligence Studies Project, the Strauss Center for International Security and Law, the Clements Center for National Security, welcome to the fourth annual Intelligence Symposium. In particular, we want to say thank you and welcome to our impressive lineup of experts, current and former intelligence officials who traveled from Washington at some, at some inconvenience yesterday, I would note, um, to participate in today's symposium. For those of you who were in Austin yesterday, you may have seen the rain. I thought for a while there we might be holding today's session in an arc, but it, uh, it, it lightened up for us. The Chamber of Commerce answered our prayers. So very, real quickly, I'd like to give you just a, a slight update on the Intelligence Studies Project, uh, thematically shaped today's uh, event, and then uh, we'll get right into the substance of it. So the Intelligence Studies Project continues to expand and diversify its programs along each of our three lines of activity. We're involved in academic coursework, policy-relevant research, and, of course, public events like this one here today. And this spring, I would add that we're piloting a graduate course in covert action and U.S. national security policy making. We're also continuing our outreach to UT's undergraduate population with a lecture-style course on U.S. intelligence and national security. In late May, we're going to be organizing the inaugural Texas Intelligence Academy. This is an ex intensive residential course held in Washington, D.C. for a select group of undergraduate students from across the UT system. Regarding our research activities, we'll soon announce the fourth round of the Inman Award competition that recognizes exceptional student writing on intelligence. We're currently supporting an exciting book project on US strategic intelligence that coincidentally is being co-edited by one of today's panelists, Dr. Treverton. Um, and then finally, I would remind folks that the ISP's first postdoctoral fellow Dr. Kirill Avramov has arrived in Austin and is continuing his research and writing on an increasingly uh, significant topic, and that would be uh, Russia's interference in Eastern and Central European elections. So Kirill's in the back of the room. Make sure you introduce yourself uh, to him. In addition to organizing today's symposium, the ISP hosts regular public talks by interesting speakers, including most recently the Director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, Robert Cardillo, former CIA Director John Brennan. John's becoming something of a familiar face here on campus since his appointment last year as a university distinguished scholar and a senior advisor to the ISP. So a confession, in labeling today's uh, symposium as the fourth annual, uh, I'll admit that our math may be a little bit dodgy, uh, and I'll explain what I mean what I mean by that. Our annual intelligence symposium very often, as today's certainly will, uh, strays into areas of public policy. And then, in turn, the National Security Forum, which we host along with the Strauss and Clements Centers in the fall, frequently touches on intelligence topics. There's no clear delineation there. You may recall last fall's event when CIA Director Mike Pompeo was here um, sharing his unique blend of policy and intelligence uh, <laughs> In insights with you all. And now if Director Pompeo is confirmed by the U.S. Senate, he'll have an opportunity to put those lessons that we learned here to good use as the nation's chief diplomat. So for those of you who are keeping score, just a reminder, in 2015 we took stock of progress 10 years after the post-9-11 intelligence reforms had gone into effect. The next year we focused on supervision and oversight of our secret intelligence agencies in a democratic society. Last year, we examined the challenges of gathering intelligence in a domestic setting while safeguarding Americans' civil liberties and privacy rights. I have to also confess that this year's title was not particularly creative, confronting 21st century challenges. As I say, not overly descriptive of what we aim to do and not particularly enticing, but we got you here, so let me tell you quickly what we have in mind. So all of us have come to accept that U.S. intelligence is going to be the object of regular intense, and generally critical attention from both the media and the chattering classes in Washington. What's perhaps most striking and troubling about the current moment 
is that the most reckless and damaging of these criticisms originate with the official who ultimately leads our intelligence community and stands to benefit most from its success. But there's not a great deal here at an academic conference 1,300 miles from Washington that we can do to help our intelligence leaders navigate this or adapt its services to the, to the uniquely capricious foreign policy that we seem to be pursuing. So for today's event, what we've tried to do is raise our sights somewhat, draw attention to some of the most serious strategic challenges that are confronting U.S. intelligence. In other words, what should far-sighted community and agency leaders be thinking about today as they prepare U.S. intelligence for challenges that may still be on the horizon? This is what we've asked Director Coates to address in his keynote remarks at lunch. In turn, we've targeted our morning and afternoon panel sessions to two of these strategic challenges. First, the need for democratic legitimacy, or how should our intelligence leaders and the institutions that oversee them go about building and sustaining public trust? No government institution can survive in a democracy without some significant reservoir of public approval and trust. Not coincidentally, the Intelligence Studies Project is now sponsoring a multi-year polling effort that seeks to measure the level intensity of that public support. The early results, and we'll be publishing this in the next several weeks, I expect, confirm that Americans do, in fact, hold a generally favorable view of their intelligence agencies. But most Americans don't believe that these agencies are particularly serious about respecting their privacy and their civil liberties. So there's a lot of work to do on that front. The second challenge that we've singled out is competence. The American people cannot be asked to direct more than $70 billion of their taxpayer dollars each year to an enterprise that does not deliver on its central charge to produce unique insights on the threats facing the nation. And so this afternoon we'll hear from a uniquely experienced and thoughtful group of experts about these threats and what the IC must do today to prepare for them. I would add here that in planning for the symposium, we did identify a third strategic challenge facing U.S. intelligence, and that's the challenge of technology. And so I would encourage you to just watch for a future Intelligence Studies Project event devoted exclusively to that topic. It's that serious in our view. Now, there are a number of people that deserve to be thanked for their work in planning and presenting this particular uh, symposium. We don't have time to thank everybody, but I do want to single out the incredibly tireless and hardworking staffs of the ISP, the Strauss Center, and the Clements Centers. They do extraordinary work. The ISP also values and appreciates its academic host and a symposium co-sponsor, the LBJ School of Public Affairs. Finally, and because it may be the last opportunity for me to do so publicly, the ISP has benefited enormously from the support of UT System Chancellor Bill McRaven and the Texas National Security Network that he championed. The audience today includes faculty and students from across the UT system. And Admiral McRaven is here this morning and maybe throughout much of the day, so I would encourage you to join me in thanking him for everything he's done for our national security programs here at the university. One final notice, or you may take it as a warning. Uh, for folks who may wish to ask a question or get involved in the discussion a little bit later in the day, you should know that all of today's events are being live streamed on the LB, excuse me, not the LBJ, the UT Austin website as well as the ISP website. And this will be replayed at a future date on the Horns of a Dilemma podcast with the War on the Rocks blog site. So you'll be able to capture this and, and use it in your future research or your journalism whatever direction you choose to go. So we've asked our moderators to go light on introduction and biographies today to save time for substantive discussions. There's a handout at the registration table with full profiles of our symposium participants. And so on that front, I'm prepared to lead by example uh, and call up our first panel. This panel is going to be moderated by Matthew Waxman, friend of the programs, uh, former Defense and State Department official, as well as a member of the NSC staff, Matthew's currently professor at the Columbia University School of Law. So I'll welcome our first panel to the stage. Thanks.
Steve, you, you just want me to save about 20 minutes. Uh, let's see, why don't uh, sure, do that. <clears throat> Well, uh, thank you all for, uh, for being here, and thank you very much to our, uh, to our hosts. I'm looking forward to this discussion. Uh, intelligence uh, has been critical to American security since uh, the Revolutionary War, um, and especially the extent of uh, U.S. intelligence activities uh, expanded dramatically after World War II uh, as U.S. security responsibilities around the world grew. Um, but intelligence also sits a bit uncomfortably um, with our American democratic system and some U.S. democratic principles. Uh, intelligence requires secrecy, but our democracy relies on the idea of an informed electorate. Um, we believe in rule of law, uh, but intelligence operations sometimes require skirting international or foreign laws. Um, and these challenges pose, uh, 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 or, or these tensions pose challenges for the legitimacy um, of the U.S. intelligence community, U.S. intelligence efforts. Um, and today, those uh, legitimacy challenges, I think, are exacerbated, as Steve Slick said, um, by some political factors. Um, some political factors, uh, uh, like uh, go, going back a few years, like the Snowden leaks, but also more recently, uh, 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 hyperpartisanship uh, in Congress, combined with moves by the current president to uh, uh, discredit some intelligence, intelligence process um, and even some intelligence leaders. Um, so to talk about this issue, we have a terrific panel. I'm going to be very brief in introducing them because you do have their full bios. Uh, Steve Aftergood is director of the Federation of American Scientists Project on Government Secrecy and a prolific writer and advocate on secrecy issues. Uh, ben Hubner is the Privacy and Civil Liberties Officer at the CIA, uh, and he previously worked on intelligence issues at the U.S. Department of Justice. Eric Schmidt is a highly acclaimed senior correspondent of the New, from, the, from the New York Times, um, where his investigative journalism has included uh, a, a lot of coverage of U.S. counterterrorism operations around the world. Um, and finally, Greg Treverton, uh, former chairman of the National Intelligence Council, now affiliated with numerous institutions, including USC uh, and the Belfer Center. And I should also mention he was one of my very first professional bosses when I was just a little pup research analyst at RAND. Um, so very good to... Uh, uh, to be here again with, uh, with Greg. So uh, let me actually uh, turn to Greg to, to, to lead us off um, and, and introduce the topic from a, a bit of a historical perspective. Um, where have we come or, uh, or not come since the church committee and the, the big 1970s era of reform? Great. Well, thanks. It's a great pleasure to be here and to be on this panel and to see you again, Matt. What I thought I would do is reflect a little bit on the role of Congress uh, and, and intelligence in, in protecting, trying to uh, establish democratic legitimacy for intelligence activities. Um, the theme of my, of my remarks, which will be brief, is really kind of from overlook to oversight to on your own. And I'll explain what I mean. Uh, the, for most of the Cold War, the approach to intelligence by Congress was mostly overlook. There's a famous story, probably apocryphal, but maybe not, about the CIA director, DCI, coming to one of the grandees on the Hill, probably John Stennis, uh, to brief him, and the entire briefing consisted of Stennis saying, son, do you have what you need to do your job? Do you have enough resources? Well, that all changed, as we know, with Watergate, with the revelations about Chile, uh, and then my first job was actually on the church committee uh, in the 1970s. It's, a, it's awkward when you're old enough so that history is something you remember. <laughs> but it was a wonderful introduction to Washington. One kind of spoiled me for the Hill forever after. We had enormous claim on senatorial attentions because this was just as sexy for them as it was for us, all these highly classified briefings that had no bearing on their political future. But it was a wonderful experience. And from here, it looks like almost another country. The kind of bipartisanship that happened then is so different from now, but it's worth reflecting that at least it did exist. Uh, we got to know the senators pretty well. I remember lots of fun moments. There was a, uh, we were, in those days you could still smoke cigars inside, uh, and one of our closed sessions, uh, 
uh, Frank Church, the chair, offered uh, John Tower, a good, good Republican from Texas, uh, a cigar. And Tower, as you remember, was a small man. I think he was always slightly worried about it, but he was sweet in this. He said, oh, no, Frank, uh, if I have a cigar now, it may stunt my growth. Uh, <laughs> in any case, the, uh, the, those committees, particularly the church committee, produced sort of the, seems to be the basic uh, outline of oversight, which worked pretty well for about a decade and a half. Uh, it, it, the committees themselves became permanent. Uh, the committees contributed to erecting a wall, particularly the FBI, between law enforcement and intelligence, which we busily dismantled after 9-11, but it was probably the right thing to do in 1976, and also laid the basis for um, the FISA, the FISA Act, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, and that process. So I think that worked pretty well for about 15 years. As things got more partisan over Central America, for example, the model fray, the, the idea was that the committees would really be surrogates for the American people if the American people could know what was going on. And I think that did work pretty well. It got frayed over Central America, the Bolin Amendment. And then the big change, I think, was both uh, the change in target, 9-11, where we moved from mostly worrying about things over there to worrying about things that might be here as well. And that coincided with the dramatic increase in partisanship. Uh, so once you, if you have the target is here, then you need to collect, or at least use, a lot of information on citizens and residents. And that, I think, changes the nature of the, uh, of the oversight task pretty dramatically. The idea that the, Ameri- that the committees can be surrogates uh, for the American people, no, yeah, I think you have to do a much better job with the American people themselves. So that's my on your own. It seems to me increasingly the oversight process on the Hill is pretty badly broken. And we have dueling memorandums from the Democrats and Republicans on the House Committee, pretty badly broken. And I think that means that intelligence agencies and the intelligence community will be more on their own. And that suggests to me a dramatic increase in transparency, something very uncomfortable for the agencies. But it, it, it seems to be necessary that the American people have to understand more about how intelligence agencies do their work Is there some cost in terms of bad guys learn? Of course there is. But that seems to me to be built into the process. Let me just end with one example and then one other comment. The example for me, striking example, is the 215 uh, uh, telephone metadata program, which was very carefully crafted to listen in to, to the fewest conversations possible. Use the metadata to decide which conversations you want to look at and look at only those. And when we finally got around to publishing the numbers, pretty striking. The numbers of conversations actually looked at was in the tens, not the hundreds or thousands. But by that time, Snowden and company had characterized this as mass surveillance, which we know isn't possible in any case, and the game was essentially over. So trying to be more proactive, more transparent, it does run very much against the grain, but seems to me to be increasingly important and all the more so because now, as Steve said in his introduction, uh, not just the legitimacy, but also the credibility of intelligence agencies is under some threat, unfortunately, also from the top. Uh, but that makes it, I think, all the more important to t- tell the American people as much as you can about what you're doing and how you do it. Uh, there are obviously limits, but that seems to be critical as we think about the next phase in democratic legitimacy. That's a, a great way to kick us off. Why don't I turn then uh, to Ben, uh, as somebody sitting inside the intelligence community today. Perhaps you could uh, give your impression or, 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 or reflect on, on Greg's comments, the historical lessons, and talk also a little bit about how the intelligence community has more recently strived to, to uh, put into practice some of those lessons. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, Steve. And, and thank you all for coming out here. It's, a, it's always great to see this large group of folks interested in the work that we do. Um, so my name is Ben Hubner. I'm the CIA's Privacy and Civil Liberties Officer. Um, and I think it is absolutely the case um, that we have learned an enormous amount from some of the work that you did, Greg, on, on the church committee. Um, and to sort of pause and reflect on that, um, so you generally know what the CIA's mission is. You know that it is our mission to acquire foreign intelligence to conduct all-source analysis to conduct covert action 
um, when and only when directed by the president. Um, but all of that is underlined um, by de democratic legitimacy. There is no computer powerful enough. There is no human asset valuable enough. There is no algorithm nuanced enough that will allow us to protect the nation if we lose the public trust. It is the first and foremost thing that we need to do. It is that important. Um, and that's not the thing I wanted to tell you, because you already know that. Um, and that, to me, is actually the more interesting, important point. That type of consensus, that consensus of the need for democratic legitimacy to conduct intelligence affairs, that is not preordained. And it's not shared in a lot of parts of the world. So I think you'll hear from all of us, I, I'm hoping we'll have a, a, a bit of a, a debate on exactly the how and how well we're doing in terms of that. But I doubt you're going to hear any disagreement about the why. Um, and that's an important point not to be forgotten. Um, all right, enough rhetoric. Let's talk about what we're actually doing. Um, and I want to uh, highlight just a couple of efforts, and, and there are a number of them. So we, we um, DNI um, Clapper, um, and now DNI Coates has also supported what we refer to as the principles of intelligence transparency. How do you do this complex task of um, ensuring that the public knows what the authorities of the intelligence community are, understands the broad scope um, of, of the activities that we engage in, yet at the same time not giving away the sources and the methods? Um, it, it is not easy. Um, and it is actually not cheap. It's actually quite, quite expensive um, to find ways of doing that. I, I want to talk just about a couple of activities. The first is something that we did at the CIA uh, last year. So we have something called, um, and you can tell that we're great with naming things, the Executive Order 12333 Attorney General Guidelines. The Attorney General Guidelines are the set of principal procedures that we apply at the CIA to protect Americans' information. They govern who and when and where we can target. They govern what we can acquire and what considerations we have to think about when we're looking at what we can acquire. They govern how long we can retain information. They govern what we can use it for. They govern how and to whom we can disseminate that information. They are absolutely critical to the work that the CIA does to ensure that we are not impinging on privacy and civil liberties. Um, they are also almost entirely classified forever. Um, we've had these for decades, um, but we didn't really tell people about them. Uh, we released them once before, and I think it was 2014. I might be off by a year. They were, it was only because of a FOIA, and they were, I will say, pretty heavily redacted. Um, and they were pretty heavily redacted in part because they had a good degree of sources and methods in them. So we needed to update those guidelines, and we needed to update them because, to be honest, they did, just weren't terribly functional um, in the digital environment where, where we're operating in. Um, where there's a lot more Americans' information in, in the atmosphere um, that, that we work. Um, but we made a decision when we decided to update them, and our decision was grounded in transparency, that it, it was no longer acceptable for us to have these rules, to take these issues so seriously, and then not tell anybody about that. So we re rewrote the entire guidelines um, uh, from stem to stern, covering all of those issues, and some, you know, pretty tough things for the agency to talk about in terms of what we do and how we do it. Um, and we made them entirely unclassified. And then we released them to the public proactively. There's not a redaction in, in those guidelines. There is not a classified annex. Those are the whole thing. Um, and in so doing, we put those out, and we put out explanatory materials. And we met with the press, and we met with the NGOs um, to talk about some of the core aspects of, of how we handle information in a digital age. That would not have happened, I will say, five or ten years ago. Um, and I think that is evidence of, um, and you mentioned Mr. Snowden. Um, I strongly believe that, uh, that his unauthorized disclosures uh, were not a cause, um, but were a catalyst in this area. We were heading in this direction anyway, and we had to be heading in this direction anyway, given the digital environment that we operate in. Um, but they probably did speed things along. Um, another area that I'll hit on, and we'll probably return to this, is that so we talked about the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. So we just finished a debate in Congress about reauthorizing what is called the Section 702 program. 
And that's a program that is used to target non-US persons who are located outside the United States with the compelled assistance of electronic service providers here in the United States. Um, that is a long way of saying what it really is, which is it is not the only tool, but it is the single most important tool that we have in the fight against terrorism. Um, it, it is an incredibly critical tool, and it became an incredibly controversial tool um, in the wake of the Snowden disclosures. And so we engage in an unprecedented transparency effort with respect to that program. We released, um, again, the procedures under which it, was, uh, it operates. We released the court opinions by the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, the FISC, um, that govern it. We released the transcripts. We released the compliance incidents. We released the compliance reports. Um, we released the information that we had provided to Congress in 2012 when it had last been reauthorized so we could show <laughs> what Congress knew at, the, at, the, at that point. Um, and I think we were pretty successful because the debate that we then had in Congress um, was a lot more factual than it was in those kind of early post-Snowden days. We had a debate, we had a discussion, and we had a good amount of disagreements, but they were based on how the program actually was, as opposed to how it was conceived to be. Um, and I think that was a big win. I have a couple of others, but I've already spoke for a while, so. Great, well with that, why, why don't I turn uh, uh, to Steve and then to, to Eric next, as one of the things I, I, I have certainly found, having worked inside government and now uh, uh, moved to the world of academia, is that uh, uh, transparency looks very different on the inside than it does on the outside of, of government. So Steve, uh, you've spoken in the, in the past about the need to think about uh, uh, different types of legitimacy and different audiences of legitimacy. Perhaps you could explain what you, what you mean by that. Well, the, the question posed by the title of our, our session is how to enhance democratic legitimacy. And it occurs to me that depending on how the terms are defined, that is either very simple or it is practically impossible. It is simple in the sense that if legitimacy means that the intelligence community operates within a framework of law, um, we've already achieved that. There are laws governing intelligence operations. Budgets are allocated by law. Um, there are um, measures taken to ensure that laws are complied with. That strict, narrow form of legitimacy has already been accomplished. But if legitimacy means something broader, like approval, support, um, identification, um, you know, a, a general favorable valuation, um, that is probably going to be permanently out of reach. And the reason for that, well, there are several reasons. One reason is that there are too many um, problematic aspects of uh, intelligence policy and practice um, that people simply, that there is no unanimous, there cannot be unanimous support for, whether it's whether it's um, waterboarding or the decision to go to war in Iraq or every few years somebody rediscovers the MK Ultra program from the, from the early Cold War years. Um, these are stains on the record of the intelligence agencies that will never be totally wiped away. But nevertheless, there's a broad middle ground, you know, between trivial legitimacy and total acceptance. And that's where I think um, our efforts need to be focused. Um, it's interesting that DNI Coates just last week, um, a week from today, a week ago today, put out a memo to intelligence agency heads um, calling transparency a foundational element of securing public trust. And I think that sort of ratifies the, the, the trend that, that Greg and Ben have been talking about, that there's a recognition um, within the intelligence community that transparency is the key to, um, to, in, to, uh, to winning public support. Difficulty, though, is what does transparency really mean? and what kind of transparency is, will, will help to build support. Um, 20 years ago, I um, filed a Freedom of Information Act lawsuit um, asking for the dollar amount of 
the uh, intelligence budget request for the following year. And the DCI at that time, George Tenet, filed a sworn declaration in my, in my lawsuit saying, absolutely not. We're never going to do this. If we did this, some clever adversary could infer from the request numbers uh, something sensitive about U.S. intelligence that needed to be protected. Um, I myself did not find the argument persuasive, but the judge did, and, um, and, and I, I lost my lawsuit. Now, uh, two decades later, the publication of the budget request for the next year's intelligence budget is routinely released. Last month, there's a, there's a, there's a, uh, an, a press release on the ODNI website saying it is whatever it is, and, uh, and it's, now, it's now the new normal. So there has been a, a progression, there has been a, a, an expansion of transparency um, in a way that I think is very important. Uh, budget disclosure is one of the, one of the uh, areas specified, the, one of two areas specified in the U.S. Constitution as being um, something that must be published. So I thought that was an important breakthrough. <coughs> Excuse me, but it did not solve all of our problems. Um, and it did not win uh, an enormous amount of public trust. Instead, people sort of took it for granted. Of course they should be doing that. And so the question really is, what, it, what kind of transparency is needed to, uh, to build trust? Um, in his memo last week, DNI Coates uh, identified a few uh, areas that he thought were exemplary. One is the intelligence.gov website, which provides all kinds of information about individual agencies. Another was a new historical declassification program, which is now working on release of records about the Tet Offensive from the <laughs> Vietnam War. And a third was had to do with um, uh, uh, court rulings and other matters pertaining to the 702 program. And I think all of those are commendable. And, and, and necessary, and I'm grateful for them, but I think they fall short of actually contributing to a growth in public trust. And I think the element that they are lacking is an element of public engagement and um, finding out what the public wants and responding to that. Um, maybe we can talk some more about that later, but I would conclude with the thought that Legitimacy, democratic legitimacy, is not something that the intelligence community can bestow upon itself. It is something that emerges from a relationship. It emerges from a relationship with overseers. It emerges from a relationship with the public. And to the extent that those, and, and for that matter, with, with uh, customers in the executive branch. And to the extent that those relationships can be nurtured through transparency, I think trust can be built. But simply putting out documents as, as important and necessary as that is, that's probably not going to be enough. Thanks. So, Eric, why don't I turn to you to give the perspective of, of, of a member of the press? And, in, I mean, you're somebody who probably bumps up a lot against the limits of, of transparency. And so could you speak to, to, to these issues from, from your perspective and also talk about the, the current state of relations between the, the, the press, especially investigative journalism, and the intelligence community? Sure. <clears throat> and thank you, Matt, and thank you all for being here and for inviting to be a part of this panel. Uh, to be, in short and to be blunt, the relationship is not good between the media and the intelligence community right now. And it's, it's strained. There are strained relations between uh, reporters and the media in general, various intelligence agencies. And, and men, much of this is not new, because if you look at our, our two jobs, the intelligence community's job in, in large part is, is to collect and preserve secrets. And the press's job is to unearth those secrets and publicize them in a responsible, deliberate way. And so there's always going to be a tension. And as long as I've been covering this, this area for almost 30 years now, that's, that's been the tension we, we do. The, the key is, as Steve said, how do you find this, this middle ground, I think? And that's, I think, where we're, we're really falling into some, into some problems now 
uh, because of what we see at the top uh, in, the, in the effect that the President's own comments have had on this relationship in general. And it, 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 you can't help but wonder if you're either in, in our position or in the IC's position when you have a President who condemns leaks of classified information as previous Presidents have done, but then in the Oval Office discloses classified information to Russian officials provided by a valuable ally, the Israelis. You have a President who does not fully embrace, in fact, distance himself from the IC's conclusion on whether, not whether, but the fact that Russia did meddle in the 2016 elections. You have a President who personally assails senior intelligence officials, retired officials now, such as Director Clapper, Director Brennan. I mean, what is one to think about any kind of transparency and coming forth when you have a president making those comments. Right now, my sense is that the IC is in a defensive crouch more than ever before because they're scared to death about saying something that's going to end up in a tweet, a bolt from lightning coming down from mar lago or the White House. And what is the incentive to be transparent when that is the, that is the sense from the top? And, and in our role in the media, we're, we're grappling with this every day. The New York Times, the Washington Post, the, the mainstream media, the failing New York Times, as the president likes to talk about. <laughs> well, let me tell you what the failing New York Times has, has tried to do. We have, we have kind of re-energized. We've had to regroup in how we cover this White House, how we cover this presidency. We've increased the size of our bureau in Washington. We've doubled the number of correspondents covering the White House right now. I think we're covering, uh, we're covering uh, President Obama. And more than anything before, I think what we've had to do against not only these charges of fake news and the swirly notion that we're seeing of, of people's trust in public institutions such as the media uh, declining, we have to take upon ourselves and, and really look in, internally and look closely and see how can we be more transparent about how we go about our job of gathering information, about deciding which stories we put out on the web, which stories we put on the front page and why, how the tone of these stories is doing, why we assign certain reporters to certain stories. We have to be more transparent in this process so people have more trust in us to convey this information about what you all are doing in the intelligence community. And, I, and we caveat that by saying we're only getting a glimpse, oftentimes just a shadow of what's going on in these programs, whether it's some of the programs we've discussed here or what I often end up writing about are very, very sensitive uh, operations in the field carried out by U.S. Special Operations Officers, where we go to great lengths to be responsible in what we talk about, certainly never writing about future operations, but also being sensitive when we're talking to sources about sources and methods, things that the enemy can use against U.S. personnel in the field or their partners. So what have we been doing? Some of these things are very small, but if you look at the print newspaper, every day on page two, we now have a feature story that goes behind the scenes to try and explain to you, how did we come to write that story, <clears throat> such as the story we had today with five different reporters <clears throat> reporting on whether or not the president's lawyer sought pardons uh, for people like uh, Manafort and Flynn. How did that story come to be? What is the genesis of it? pull back a little bit of the, uh, of the secrecy that I think people find in order to explain the effort that we go to, the lengths that we go to to get information, to vet it, to pursue it, and to make sure it is grounded in truth. I, <clears throat> I was at an awards ceremony in Washington last week uh, where the Washington Post was honored for its great reporting on the, uh, the campaign of George Roy Moore in Alabama. And one of the scariest instances they talk about, scary from the sense of a journalist, was not only the courageous you know, work and the diligent work they did in, in tracking down the women who made these accusations and, and hearing their stories and hearing how the, these women had the courage to come forward, but also disclosing the fact of how the opposition side, in this case Judge Moore or his supporters, actually planted someone, a woman who claimed that she had been raped when she was 15 or 16 by Judge Moore and wanted to tell her story to the Post reporters, hoping that they would be taken in by this, as, as, they, in, as one of the other women. It turned out her story was completely false. And in the, in the efforts they went to track down 
who this woman was, who was backing her, and it turned out to be supporters of the judge, and the lengths that that campaign was going to try and discredit the otherwise factual and very carefully prepared information that the Post was doing. That's the environment we're living in today in the media, where we are being fed false news, just as I'm sure you all in the IC or here in the academic communities are. How do you, how do you tell fact from fiction anymore? Right? It's not as in the old days, everybody had a spin, but now this whole information stream is infected with this, this type of stuff, and we need to be very careful in how we do this. The White House has tried to pit the media against uh, this administration, make us out to be the opposition force, if you will. We're not taking the bait. As my editor, Dean Baquet, and the editor of the Washington Post, Marty Barron, has said, we're not at war, we're at work, and relentlessly so. And that's the, what we'll continue to do. And I'm hoping through discussions like this, in working through, whether it's with members of the military, the intelligence community, the diplomatic corps, and administration officials, who, who really believe in the importance of transparency as an underlying foundation for our democracy and our government, that we can all work a little bit more closely together and understand, yes, we, we will be a conflict. There will oftentimes will be disagreeing on what facts can be out there. How do you shade this? But in my career, in working with many of you all in this audience, we've usually been able to come to some kind of agreement. May not be a perfect solution on either side, but we're pushing forward. I think the information that Americans today need more than ever to make informed decisions to make sure our, our democracy stays a vibrant one. Thank you. That's great. So um, uh, to, to sort of to bring the discussion to, together a bit, I, I think I heard Steve emphasizing especially well, a, a couple of things. One was um, on, on the, the bright side, perhaps this um, sort of natural progression you talked about of, of greater uh, uh, transparency, even if in, in small increments, but also uh, the need for some beyond, beyond just transparency, <coughs> release of documents, some genuine public engagement. Mm -hmm. uh, Eric, you talked about those, some, some real challenges to having that kind of public engagement today, I think especially in light of, of, of some, as, some factors of the, of the political environment, um, hyper-partisanship, the, the, let's just say, some special attributes of this particular White House. Uh, and so maybe, Greg, if I could, if I could turn back to you, because one, one question I then have is, how should we think about the current environment, current debates, current issues, um, and these, th th this kind of Washington infighting in in included, how should we think about that historically? Um, is this sort of just a, a, a par for the course? Is this something that ebbs and flows, or are we dealing with something unique? And uh, I turn to you as somebody, not, not because of your age, but your experience, your wisdom, <laughs> thank yes, you, thank you. To, to, to think about, help us think about historically. Well, it's a great question. I think the honest answer is we don't know, right? We've, we've seen periods close to this in history, but not recently. There was a Civil War period. So it's, it's been bad in Washington, certainly much worse now than I've ever seen it in my lifetime. But that may be because we did have this Cold War bipartisanship, which lasted for quite a long time. So I think the honest answer is we don't know. A lot of the things we do know, like the fact that all this wonderful IT has become not a way to connect people, but a way to separate them in their own little echo chambers. That is going to continue, it seems to me, and that's become a fact of our, our political life. So it's hard for me to see, it's easier for, easier for me to see some change in the tenor at the top uh, than it is in some of the fundamentals that are driving this hyperpolarization and separation. I just also want to pick up Steve's point about engagement, because I think it's exactly right. It, it's, it's really good to get documents out, get things out, but really engaging is important. I, I was struck when I was chairing the NIC. I did a lot of public speaking. I'd been around the rodeo, uh, rodeo enough times to know that the last thing I ever wanted to do was write talking points, because then I had to have them cleared. If I didn't write any, they couldn't be cleared. But I was struck, even in a Washington audience, uh, I, their understanding of what intelligence did and how it worked was not very good. Uh, and sort of engaging them always resulted in a really interesting conversation that never got anywhere near sources and methods, but did get into kind of what are we looking at, how do we do our work, what do we think, how do we think about differences of view, all those things I think that were uh, part of kind of engaging the public. 
I think in some ways that's all the more important now because of this, what do we call it, the combination of big divides in society exacerbated by a lot of turbulence at the top. So that's actually, a, so I, I think, a good point to pick up on and, and useful, especially with this panel, is to think about some practical positive steps um, that, you might, uh, uh, that you might recommend. I mean, if it sounds like there's a great deal of consensus on this panel about transparency and public engagement, and, but also a lot of wisdom about what's realistic, um, what, what can realistically be done, um, especially at this moment, in order to, to push those kinds of uh, I, I, the, to push that kind of agenda forward, maybe I, I turn. Well, I, I turn to, to anybody, um, but maybe start with with, with Ben um, to talk a little bit about some specific uh, steps that you've either uh, been considering or engaged in, or or, or that you might recommend. I mean, you, you mentioned Ben the 702 reauthorization debate, and and, and maybe that's a, a, a good example um, to, to, to start with. I know that some people regard that as, um, as, 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 a, as sort of a model of, well, you know, we had a, a congressional debate. There was a, a lot of civil society. On both sides of the issue was engaged in the merits of different reform proposals. I think there are others who, who look at that process and say, actually, it was, um, you know, the result was fairly preordained and it was, uh, and, 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 uh, uh, and, and, and the process was, was superficial. I'm curious about your perspective or uh, either on that or on other specific ways in which we might push forward this transparency slash public engagement agenda. Let me try for both. Um, I, I will say for, for those of us involved in the process, it did not feel preordained at all. Um, so we learned a lot from the, the 702 process. Um, I, we were very naive. I think our, our thought was after those releases happened, we would go and release a number of um, primary documents, and uh, everyone would read those primary documents, of course. Um, and in you know three three to six months, we would move on to the next issue. Um, that of course was not the case. Now that being said, I think you do have to look at your audiences, um, and you need to speak to all of them. You have to start with those primary documents, and particularly in a sometimes fact-free environment, putting out the actual original authentic document. There, document, there is no substitute for that. Because one of your audiences is always going to be those deep divers, the people who go in and want to see the original document. But you can't only speak to those. Because for every deep diver, there's going to be 10 or 100 or probably 1,000 swimmers, people who are very interested in these issues. But they're not lawyers themselves. Um, they're not going to spend the time of going through a 500-page report. Um, but that doesn't mean they care any less. Um, and they're going to be looking um, to a couple of different sources. They're going to be looking to um, some validators. They're going to look for independent analysis. They're going to look to the New York Times um, to, see, to see what that analysis looks like. And you need to make sure that you're providing information and materials and, and having engagement for those audiences. Um, and on top of that, for every, for every one of those swimmers, there's going to be 10 or 100 or 1,000 skimmers. Right? Um, this is not, they've got a lot going on in their life. right? That doesn't mean that they don't care at all about their own privacy or civil liberties, but they're not going to probably engage in, in, in any sort of depth. And you need to understand that that's an important audience as well. Right? If one of the things that I do in my job is, is go out and, and, and speak in, in small groups and larger groups to NGOs um, um, like Steve's. Um, but if we only do that, and, and here's some self-criticism there, if we only speak to sort of the K Street equivalent of the NGO community, we have, we have missed the boat. Um, we need to come, well, we need to come out here. Um, we need to go into our communities um, and, and talk about these issues. We, at the agency, of course, are, are, are constantly recruiting, right? And, and we have, um, as, as Director Brennan used to say, maybe the best business case for diversity of any organization in America. In having those conversations with those communities, you know, joining the CIA is actually really a family decision. And so we need to talk to the families about it. And those families have concerns. And those concerns are not too different from the rest of the American public. Who are these guys? What are you going to do for them? Are you going to be coming, doing things that are going to come back and hurt our community? We need to be able to engage with those folks as well as part of our public engagement. It doesn't mean that we stop doing um, 
putting out some of the primary documents and some of the historical information. Those, those are important as well. Um, but we can, we have to do more than that. Great. Steve, do you want to speak to that? Um, uh, a couple of things. Um, it, it occurs to me that intelligence, at least intelligence analysis, is, is not just a job. It's also an intellectual discipline. And the intelligence community is perhaps the only part of our government that attempts to um, critically uh, 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 examine its own perceptions of reality and to ask, what are we missing? What's out there that we're not seeing that we should be seeing? How are we being blinded by our own biases? And, and that gives it a, a unique kind of, at least potentially a unique kind of authority. And so one practical thing that the intelligence community can and must do is to simply do an excellent job of performing its own work. Um, you know, the, the Environmental Protection Agency, under its current leadership, uh, has been hemming and hawing about climate change. Is it, is it, is it real? Is it significant? Is it, is it, is it human uh, generated? They've taken lots of documents off the EPA website. DNI Coates, in his um, uh, annual threat briefing to the Senate Intelligence Committee, just came out and said, look, climate change is a hazard and it's going to have national security implications. So simply telling the truth, first discovering the truth at the, to the best of your ability, and then telling the truth is an act of tremendous power. And I think that's something that, that should always, that, that intelligence agencies should always strive to do. Um, a second sort of practical step that I would like to see that I think is um, more than just, you know, tossing stuff out is, is, um, really, is, is packaging some of the open source intelligence that the intelligence community already collects. Um, there is an open source enterprise at CIA, and very little of the material from there ever makes it into the public domain. But what has come out, I've just seen tons of stuff, or at least some stuff that's excellent. It's, it's helpful for reporters. It's informative. It's, um, it's extremely valuable stuff. It doesn't implicate uh, sources and methods because it's open source. Not all of it can be released. Some of it involves copyright. Some of it involves maybe tipping off what the intelligence community's interests are. But there's lots of other stuff that could be made available that I think would help to enrich the public domain. It would make us smarter as a society if it were out there. And, um, and, it's, and we're, we're already preparing it. So it's simply a matter of deciding you know, if I had DNI Coates' ear for 15 seconds, I would tell him, um, make a product line from the open source enterprise publicly available. And I think that would, that would have positive repercussions in lots of ways. Eric, how about, how about you? I think from a reporter's standpoint, what we're always looking for is one thing, access, access, access. We need access to the senior policymakers or senior intelligence officials in this case so we can put the tough questions to them. Director Pompeo was here on this stage last fall, and it was an opportunity to engage on that. I, I applaud him and if, you know, his successors if they continue to do that, because that's one of the rare opportunities where the media does have a chance to pose questions. There are other forms where I think this can be expanded. Uh, I moderated a panel at the Aspen Security Forum two summers ago where Cyril Sartor, then the senior Africa analyst for the agency, uh, did something remarkable. He actually came to a, one of these public sessions as an analyst and did a, did a great job. He started out a little, a little rough, but then he got into the swing of it. He, he hadn't done this before, but he did a terrific <laughs> job. Um, I don't know if the agency's done anything like that. Cyril's now the senior director for Africa at the NSC. So I, I think more of that. Uh, the agency does, the DNI's office, they do do background briefings for reporters now and then. Uh, you know, the, the quality information varies depending on the briefing. More of that, I think. But I still think, again, 
there is still this kind of institutional reluctance uh, to come forward with information. And you just look at trying to get biographical information on Gina, Gina Haspel on the day her announcement <laughs> was made was impossible. <clears throat> we can't talk about her previous career. Well, it took nine days before they figured out she was getting beaten up because of what's, you know, what her nomination is going to be focused on, her, her involvement, her direction of the rendition program, Black Sites program. Uh, the came, first pictures were even of somebody else. Yeah, it was, you know, it's, I mean, it took nine days to drag this out of the agency where you kind of got this much fuller picture of who she really is and her background, what she did, you know, is he doing all that. But, you know, in a timely way, uh, it was only kind of under the threat, you know, the threat even from members of Congress. We need to have more information not only about her, but obviously more, and we'll learn more about what her involvement was in these programs. And I think this is just a hard thing, I think, for the intelligence community to do. It's just, in, it's just not in, in their DNA. To, it, but I think now, particularly as just as our credibility is coming under attack, the IC's credibility is coming under attack from all sources. And, and it needs to come forward, whether it's in the way Steve, I think, and I would applaud that idea, with some forth, be, having more public face on who you are, what you're doing, and the substance of what, on these critical issues that we're facing today, whether it's North Korea's nuclear program, whether it's Russian military intentions, whether it's the future of ISIS post-caliphate. These are all really important issues. And it just doesn't help when I call out to the agency and the first words out of the mouth of the public affairs person is, off the record, here's what I can tell you. That doesn't do me any good. <laughs> Uh, uh, oh, Greg, do you want to respond? That would be great. Uh, just an example of what seems to be an opportunity and the difficulties of taking advantage of the opportunity. Mm. And that's the cyber realm, which is really you know, supremely important. The typical government approach is to say, if there's a hack, then the intelligence community tries to attribute the hack to somebody, then passes all that to sec in secret to the policy people to decide what to do. What's interesting is, that doesn't work in cyber because while the government, while intelligence agencies are doing attribution, so are a whole bunch of private companies out there doing attribution. And they're going to uh, publicize their results when they decide, not when the government decides. In the short run, that's a nuisance for the government. But in the long run, it seems to me it'd be a great opportunity because that means a whole set of people that could be cooperated with. And since they're going to make their attributions public, that makes the sources and methods problem a little less severe. So it's, a, it's an opportunity that I think really could be a great one, but it's hard to take advantage of because it is, as Eric and everybody said, very countercultural to do that what amounts to sort of crowdsourcing uh, on something as sensitive as cyber issues. But it still seems to me a great opportunity to engage. That's great. I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn in a moment to the audience for, for questions, mm -hmm. but before I do, did anybody else on the, on, the, on the panel want to respond to anything anybody else had said? If not, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll open it up to, to questions. Uh, you, yes, sir. Admiral. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Here it comes to Admiral Inman. Matt, um, this is more of a challenge than a question. <laughs> uh, having no lived less. through Church and Pike Committee, creating the permanent select committees, interacting with the public in that time frame, the question wasn't what you know, it was how you know it. And trying to get ahead of that led President Ford to do Executive Order 11905, slightly changed by President Carter, 12033, slightly changed again by President Reagan, 12333, and lasted all the way through to the time. What was important for the employees in the wake of Church and Pike was the confidence that what they were doing for the country was legal by U.S. law in the process. And in having been stuck for four years to interact with editors and publishers <clears throat> late in the afternoon. Uh, will it be damaging if we say the following in the process? The key was to protect how you knew, not what you knew. So I worry a little about the transparency push 
if it is not in fact focused, we look to the committees to be the surrogates for the public, not the media mm -hmm. in the process. And uh, the challenge always, did you first, you got 702 added because we'd forgotten that whole area until we suddenly had people inside the US. So I would ask you to think back through how important it is internally for those who are working, a comfort level that what they're doing is within the US laws in the process. Uh, that's a, a great comment and a, and a challenge. Who wants to, to, to take it? I'll start. Great. Um, I agree. Well, that's a good way of starting. <laughs> good move. Good move. No, so, so um, I referred to those AG guidelines earlier, um, and I said that we, uh, you know, wrote rewrote them um, uh, from, from stem to stern um, to make them unclassified and transparent. And that was the reason that we did it. But there was a benefit that we weren't um, totally anticipating, which was it turns out that when you rewrite something, and you write it for release, as we like to say. Um, to be understood by the public. It is also um, a lot better understood by your own workforce. Um, and that's pretty darn critical. I, I need to have confidence as a privacy and civil liberties officer that, uh, that our officer abroad, um, who may or may not in the moment have access uh, to his attorney, knows what the rules of the road are. And that officer, just as importantly, needs to have confidence that she knows what the rules of the road are as well in determining what activity she's going to engage in. There, are, there is an aspect of kind of knowing and having those clear lines that is actually um, empowers intelligence collection um, because there can be, when there is uncertainty, um, one potential and frequent response is, is people being overcautious. Right? Um, and so having those clear lines and then educating our own workforces on what those clear lines are is a, is a very critical component. And to me, mm -hmm. one that um, kind of bring this back to transparency, one that can be done um, not so much hand in hand with what we, what we do with the public, but there, there's a lot of overlap there um, and a lot of uh, um, efficiencies. Uh, Matt? Uh, okay. Yeah, please. Well, I, I, would, I would disagree slightly. Not that it's um, not important for uh, the, the, the law to be clear, but that it's not enough um, simply to know what's legal. One of the astonishing things about the Edward Snowden revelations is that the activities he disclosed were not illegal. Um, they, uh, they had been <laughs> authorized by Congress. They had been uh, overseen and approved by the FISA court. Uh, apparently, they were all fine. The only thing they missed was the consent of the public. And the reason that there was such a big scandal was because the, 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 the uh, uh, programs that were disclosed were inconsistent with what the public believed and had been told was going on. So the fact that they were legal was sort of besides mm -hmm. the point. Um, and uh, once they became public, we saw Congress taking action to modify those programs. And what that says to me is that as long as they were classified, Congress did not accurately gauge public opinion regarding those activities. Once they became public, they had to shift. And so there was a, there was a, there was a breakdown, not so much in the intelligence community, but in the oversight process. Mm -hmm. And they, they did not accurately represent their constituents on these issues. Still, it was all legal, but it was, it, it was nevertheless scandalous. And so some, some better form of engagement is required. And I, I hear a few important points here. I mean, w one of them is that the, the American public generally um, cares not just about what the U.S. government is doing, but how the United States is, is how the United States government is doing. Uh, we've also heard, though, in, in, in this conversation, that you know one one of the important sort of institutional innovations of of our intelligence oversight system, especially post church, was this idea that the the, the, the congressional intelligence committees were supposed to play a role in. in 
oftentimes in standing in for the public. And certainly one thing that worries me is the breakdown of the effectiveness and the credibility of those <coughs> committees, um, because if they're not able in a credible, um, serious, and, 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 and trustworthy way to stand in for the public, well, then, then we certainly do need something else. Greg, did you want to get in I on this? I just wanted to pick up the, what I think is really a hard part of Bob's question, and that is that it seems, does seem to me that it, we are changing the social compact around intelligence, and a lot of that is driven by the change in target. So if you're collecting or using a lot of information on your citizens and inhabitants, that seems to me it does call for a different kind of social compact, and one that probably does take us further than you would like into how we do what we do, right? So it sure is, surely at some cost, bad guys learn that as well, but that seems to me to be necessary as we get as we continue in this realm of collecting and using a lot of data on Americans and other inhabitants. It seems to me it's just a, a cost from the community's point of view, but a necessity for, with respect to the kind of democratic legitimacy surrounding intelligence. Good. Uh, uh, why don't we take a, a, a next, uh, Mr. McLaughlin. Here. Thank you, uh, and uh, I'm sorry to uh, dominate the questions from the front tables here. You <laughs> need to go to the... We're going to move back yeah, as we go, yes. Yeah, so, but uh, we put our hands up and you recognize us. So, <laughs> it's your fault. <laughs> um, it's just kind of another sort of challenge in a way. And let me precede it by saying I will sound a bit like a troglodyte, but I'm not. In other words, I, I've always favored transparency. Hopefully, Eric would agree at least partially on that. I teach a course in this field, and I'm speaking constantly in public, seeking to illuminate how this process works. That said, uh, I think for context, it's worth uh, remembering, I think this is true, that in comparative terms, we are the most transparent country in the world when it comes to intelligence. Mm -hmm. No one else does what we do. Uh, to illustrate that, often when we receive intelligence from foreign countries in exchanges, uh, we can't tell our Congress about that intelligence because they don't tell their parliaments about that intelligence. So it, it comes down to that. Here's my point. Uh, ultimately, the role of intelligence is Transparency is part of it, but our real role is to give decision advantage to the United States in a highly competitive global struggle, okay, which is getting harder. How do we strike the balance between the transparency we need for democratic legitimacy in a big open country like ours, the, the most open in the world, while also remaining, retaining our competitive advantage against intelligence services that don't believe in that at all, and who study everything we issue for clues on who we are and what our priorities are. Seems to me that's as much of a challenge as bringing our public along, because ultimately what our public will judge most harshly in our case is what Stephen was talking about, when we don't do very well, when mm -hmm. we're beaten in that global competition. So how do we get that balance? Where's that line? Ben, do you want to talk a bit about how that, that balance plays out at, at, within the intelligence community? So the short answer is it's a constant struggle um, to, try to try to get that right. And, that, and there's no one answer, um, depending on the environment that we're operating in, uh, the needs of the public for information, what types of information are going to provide us decision advantage um, as, opposed, um, as opposed to something else. Again, sort of building on something that you said, Greg, I mean, one of the fundamental things that has changed. So if I was going to go collect for, let's just say, um, information about a hostile nation's um, missile telemetry, that is only going to have so much impact on Americans um, in terms of their personal information. And that impact is probably going to be somewhere close to zero. If I'm going to um, try to collect information against um, a group of international terrorists who are using as their primary mode of communication 
the same mode of communication that I use to share pictures of my children, that's going to have a different impact. Um, and our, our sort of responsibility um, for how we handle that information, but also how we inform the how we inform the public about how we handle that information changes. Um, we focus as much as we can about how we protect the information without trying to divulge um, how we got it. Um, and that certainly goes to the sources and methods. It is often sort of really difficult, um, even in the open source area, um, to reveal information without revealing priorities. And I think that is actually a really critical aspect for decision advantage is knowing where we have, you know, the, the intelligence community is, is large and broad, but in some ways is a fine-tuned machine. Um, there are too many issues out there for us to not prioritize. Um, and maybe the, the, one of the most important things um, that ultimately we can't re reveal is exactly where those priorities lie. Obviously, we, we, we give the, the general ideas. The annual threat briefing makes it quite clear what we think the biggest threats in this country are. Um, but when you get down to the really fine, granular releases, um, knowing where we focused our, our collection efforts, um, that's where our big debates are. Um, and that's where they're going to continue to be. And I, I, I wish I had the right answer. I don't believe there is a right answer. I think it's just going to be a constant struggle between competing priorities. Greg, you had some uh, thoughts on this I'm reluctant well. to be skeptical yeah. about something John says, but I, I want to just uh, introduce a note of skepticism about how sharp that trade-off really is. I say that for three reasons. I've always been very skeptical about this notion that if we show them what our priorities are, that's a big loss. I always, my response is always, if the Chinese don't think we're interested in them, they're not doing their job and we're not doing ours, right? So I, I'm always a little skeptical about that. Second, it does seem to me that when push comes to shove, either a lot of the stuff we need to collect uh, doesn't affect, as Ben was suggesting, Americans, or the attitude is relatively permissive. Notice that after we went through all the debates about 702 and 215, mostly the, the public attitude is, well, I don't necessarily like this very much, but Google has it anyway, and uh, if it makes it, us a little safer, fine. And third is we now are in a world that is awash in information. Uh, information is ubiquitous. So in some ways, it's much more a matter of selection than collection. We still rely on some secret sources. But for those reasons, I guess I'm a little bit skeptical that this trade-off between accountability and effectiveness is, is really very sharp. Good. Uh, next question. Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. I can't. Oh, yes. Sorry. So my question is around the secrecy of activities in the cyber realm. What are the challenges around, um, essentially, you know, the secrecy of activities in classification, whether it's you know, hacks on American soil or our activities abroad? Um, what are the challenges around that and maintaining trust with the American public and with the technology community in a post-Snowden world? Anybody want to think, start with that one? Greg. Uh, it's a great question. As I said earlier, I, th I think there's a great opportunity for uh, collaboration between intelligence and outsiders, companies and others. <coughs> there are pl plenty of reluctances on both sides, but I think it's a, it's a great opportunity for, uh, for collaboration. Because uh, attribution, as we know, is, uh, is very difficult. We had the, uh, the, you know, the Office of Personal Management hack uh, and we had an interesting debate with our policy counterparts because we were pretty sure it came from China, but beyond that, not so sure. And so the policy people kept saying, can't you tell us more? Can't you tell us more? And the answer was, China's a big country, right? Uh, uh, and we couldn't really tell them much more. And that was, for me, a kind of a salutary episode, a sort of learning experience about just how difficult attribution often is. It came after one, the Sony one, where we'd had very good luck and good work and had really very convincing attribution almost immediately. But I, I think it's, a, it's an area that, that, since it's so important, uh, I think it's really uh, the most interesting ground for new forms of public-private cooperation. I think that there's, there's a lot of that cooperation happening, and I think it, some of it 
is not as readily apparent to the public. Yeah. Um, so if you take something, uh, there's been a lot of discussion about something called the, the vulnerabilities equities process. Right? So if, if one of our intelligence agencies finds a, a vulnerability, say a zero day, um, what do we do about that? Because we might want to exploit that zero day um, in order to collect intelligence information, but it's also a vulnerability in systems that we use here in the United States all the time. Um, so we created a process in order to make those difficult decisions, and until fairly recently, we didn't reveal the fact that 90% of the vulnerabilities that we find, we in fact do provide to the private sector. Now, do we put, provide them to the private sector in a way that is very public? No. Um, why do we not do that? Mostly it's because we want to go to the, to the, the private sector, maybe the, the, the maker of that router or, or the, the writer of that software, and say, okay, you, quietly, you need to fix this um, and get that fix out. Um, because if we publicly announce it, who knows what's going to be the damage in the, in the intervening time. Um, we don't also always reveal exactly which part of the US government identified that vulnerability, right? And so even the company knows that they've been warned, but they don't know how we found that information. Um, and in part, I think that's because we're trying to protect sources and methods. And in part, I think we're being probably overly cautious in that area. Um, so there is actually a great deal of cooperation that happens. It happens, um, I don't want to say sub rosa, but um, not necessarily um, via press statement. Um, I, I would just add that um, classification standards in this area are evolving. Um, five or eight years ago, you would not see the term offensive cyber operations in a government document, and now it's pretty much an established area of military doctrine, and they don't blink when they say it. So, <laughs> uh, uh, Yes. Well, um, thanks for taking my question. It's definitely a starstruck moment. Um, <laughs> so say you have someone that you suspect poses a considerable threat to the country. And obviously there is a concerted effort amongst the agencies to verify whether or not what you suspect to be the case is the case. So how do you reconcile the problem where the only approach to verify that could possibly violate that person's civil liberties? We have lots of rules. <laughs> now, um, and that's sort of the central reason that we have these rules. We, we collect information um, from, from around the world at CIA um, and our, as do our, our sister agencies in the US government. Um, and one of the things that we realize is that we need to, we need to take that problem and, and divide it in two. Um, and one of those things is, I think, pretty actually well regulated um, by statute. Um, so if, if I were to go, and statute and, all, and also other um, executive orders, if I were to try to target, was the word we would use, and, and target just means try to focus in on one person and collect information about them. Um, then there, there are some very clear lines um, on what we can do and what we can't do. If I'm going to try to collect target information elect, through electronic surveillance against what we call a US person, so American citizen or a lawful permanent resident, um, I have to go get a court order from the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. I have to present to that court probable cause um, justifying that type of collection. Um, I, I, Many years ago, I used to write those applications. They are quite thick um, to try to make that probable cause finding. Uh, you will often hear, uh, very unfortunately and incredibly untrue, that the, the FISC, um, as we call it, is, is a rubber stamp. It is, it is not at all. Um, it's a misunderstanding of the process. Um, the process is that there are an enormous number of, of layers before you get to the FISC, uh, of lawyers at the FBI, at the Department of Justice, um, looking at this and weeding out things that don't meet that standard. But even when you get to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court, they file something called a read copy. Now I'm really nerding out with you. Um, and a read copy is just that. It's an advanced copy of the court. Do you, um, this is the case we plan to make. Um, and there's a culling there as well, right? Before the actual application is filed, you'll, you'll get you know, more informal responses back from the court saying no. Or in about 25% of the time saying yes, but. 
right? You don't have enough, you, you wanna do these four things, you just, you don't have enough um, here. Um, you haven't justified it well enough to conduct all of those activities. I'm only gonna authorize these two, these three. And the application will be revised before it actually even formally gets to the court. Um, so that's half of it, but there's another half. Um, and the other half is particularly important in the sort of the digital environment we have, which is what do you do when you wanna look at information that you have already collected for another reason um, about a US person who you think is a, is a concern. And so we also have rules there talking about um, when that's appropriate, what type of approvals would be needed for different types of collection and, and understanding, and this is I think really important, that there is just different sensitivities of different types of information. Um, what is available about me in the public um, has one level of sensitivity and that is vastly different from if you know, there was electronic surveillance of someone outside the United States and they wanted to search all of that collection for information about me and communications I might have with that individual. Um, that's a thing of a very different order. Um, and I, I think that's critical as well. It, it, it's, I get a little concerned sometimes when we try to have a, a consistent and the same set of rules across all of those levels of sensitivity. Um, because it's always the case that when everything is important, nothing is important. Um, we, we need to think about what are the really privacy, most privacy concerning things and have a set of rules for those and have a still important and still strong but different set of rules for things that we acknowledge have some privacy impact but one that is lesser. Uh, so I think unfortunately we, uh, we need to bring this to a close in just a moment but before I do it, let me just make sure that I've, I've hit everything that people wanted to speak about. Does anybody have a, any, any final remarks they wanted to make? No? Um, you know, I, I think um, we, we should be aspiring towards a situation where uh, a, a majority of the public sees the intelligence community not as some alien entity that is imposed on them, but that is fighting for their interests and, um, uh, and is, is their intelligence community, and that if they are smart enough and committed enough, they might even join it. That's, that's, the, that's the destination we want to arrive at, and uh, we should be con con conducting our policies with, with that goal in mind. That's nicely put. Very good. Well